A lot of people are asking how Starlink works and who it's for, so this video is about answering all those questions. So I've had Starlink now for almost a year, uh, not quite, about 11 months. And in that time, I've had a lot of questions from people about how Starlink works, who it's for, what does it do, how good is it, etc. Especially how good is it? Are you happy with it? Um, so let me first answer that question. I am incredibly happy with Starlink. Like, I am over the moon that we have Starlink. However, that does not mean that it is for everyone. Right. So, um, first of all, Starlink is a satellite internet connection. You may know this. Um, there are different types of satellite internet connections. Um, Starlink is what's called low Earth orbit satellites. And that means that they are only about sort of four to 600 kilometers uh, above the Earth, which means they move really fast, which means we need a lot of them. Traditional satellite providers, which is what I had before as well, was geosynchronous, which means you have one, two, you know, a number of satellites, not many, that are always in the same point in the sky. And that means that your satellite is always pointing at, sorry, your satellite dish is always pointing at that satellite, right? So it's very different technology styling. It's very different. Now, if you have the old, old school satellite technology, it is worthwhile upgrading to Starlink, right? However, if you have a fiber connection or you have um, a cable connection or you have some sort of land-based connection, it's rare that Starlink is going to be an improvement. Just saying. Um, okay, I'll get into why that is. So, but that's... um. I've got my notes over here, make sure I tell you everything. Um, now, Starlink is pretty expensive as well. Um, in Australia, it's $139 Australian a month. I think in the US, it's $109 US dollars, um, and equivalent in Europe and other places. Um, that's a lot per month for a internet connection compared to land-based connections, which are often half or less than that. So Starlink's great for a satellite connection, right? If you have an airline one, don't go there. Um, so satellites are not a fixed connection, right? There's no, it's all wireless, it's all radio signals, essentially, which means that there will be uh, dropouts, especially when it storms. So I expect always to have some sort of dropouts. For example, I have, um, we'll get to the app in just a minute, but here's the app. Uh, there's some statistics that you can look at, and it'll tell you that um, how many outages there's been. Now, in my case today, uh, there has been no outages two seconds or longer in the last 12 hours. So that's good. But that's not always the case. You will have dropouts. Um, obstructions are a huge issue for satellite connection. So the Starlink app has a, a feature where you can uh, basically photograph or video um, the sky from where you want to set up your Starlink dish. And that'll tell you where the obstructions are. But obstructions are a big deal. You can't have any trees buildings, um, like your roof or whatever it might be, uh, any mountains in the horizon can even be a problem. Um, there's a lot of things that can be a problem for obstructions for the satellite um, signal. So the satellite dish that you get with Starlink, it's not very strong, right? It's just a satellite dish. It's not going to have a ton of transmitting and receiving power. So it's important that it's uh, set up absolutely correct. Now, if you want to see where my satellite dish is it for Starlink, um, check out the link there and there's uh, another video on you know, 10 things about Starlink. So um, latency, which is how long it takes for a round trip to whatever service, that goes up and down. With a typical land connection you get somewhere around 10 milliseconds, if it's a fiber even like one or two. Starlink is often 30, 40, 50 millisecond ping, which is great for a satellite connection because it used to be 600 before and you can't change that on geosynchronous that's just how long it takes but with starlink it's a lot less however it might not be optimal if you're playing games or something like that so congestion uh, is another thing that might crop up um, so there's not unlimited bandwidth obviously on the satellites and if you are in in, this, in a cell so everything is divided into cells um, i can show you that as well on the map in in just a minute um, but there are currently about 500,000 subscribers 
on Starlink all over the world. The majority of those are in North America, which means that some of the cells there are, can be congested, especially at peak times, which means that your speed might go down a lot. So in general, you get sort of 100 megabit, sometimes 150, 200 megabit. I've had 280, I think, is the highest megabit in terms of speed. But when there's congestion, especially in North America, it might go down to 10. So it will go up and down a lot. And it also depends on how far you're away from the satellite and which satellite you're connecting to, etc. Um, I'll show you a really cool tool at the end of the video for how to see where all the satellites are. Um, so peak time congestion is a real problem and it might affect you as well, which it wouldn't normally uh, with a fiber connection, for example, or a land-based connection necessarily. Cable, it will, because cable's also a fixed bandwidth, but yeah. Um, the installation of the equipment, you have to buy the equipment, right? So you have to buy the dish. It's not something that, you know, the satellite provider I had before, they would supply the dish and then you sort of rent it or whatever. Uh, but satellite, uh, with Starlink, you buy the satellite dish, so it's yours. And you have to figure out how to install it yourself. So you can uh, you know, get someone to do it for you. You can do it yourself, which I did with moderate success. I had did a couple of things I didn't do right. Um, but you have to do it yourself. And if I show you the map here. This is the Starlink map of where there is coverage and services available. So you can see here, there's the map of the world. Uh, availability is the light blue and waitlist is the dark blue. So I was on a waitlist for about nine months before I got my dish, so that can happen. Um, but if I go, for example, down to Australia here, and I zoom in, so my state is Victoria, which is at the bottom here. You can see there's some of these hexagonal, 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 hexagonal um, spaces here, which are the cells that are now in the waitlist. So if you're in that area, you would have to go on a wait list because there's not enough capacity in that cell. So that happens, even though the majority of it is available, there might be some cells that aren't. Um, so yeah, as I said before, you do need a completely clear view of the sky when you install it. And it's a lot of trial and error with the app trying to figure out where you, are, um, where you have obstructions and not. And sometimes you get obstructions where you didn't think you would have. So it's a bit, you've got to use the app. It works quite well. Talking about speed, it's always, with internet connections, it's always the speed that's the key. Now, before I had maybe 40 megabit, 45 megabit on the old satellite connection, and now get easily over 100. It is great. It's fantastic. But whereas before, because it was a geosynchronous satellite, I was almost guaranteed to get sort of, you know, 40, 35, 40. Now it goes up and down wildly. I mentioned this before, but it's really important to understand that the satellite service from Starlink, the satellites move so fast that you're constantly connecting to a different satellite. And the speed will go up and down depending on the congestion of that satellite. It's just how it works. There's nothing to do about it. There are different versions of Starlink now as well. So I have the residential one. I actually have the Generation 1, which is a round dish. And this is now a square dish. Um, there's some differences between them. Uh, the square dish, you can't directly plug in to your uh, network so like i have unify network everywhere uh the generation one dish you could it was just plug it in you had an internet connection you have to have an adapter for the new uh generation and you know future generations might be different again but the residential one is one you put on your roof or wherever you know big pole wherever you can find a spot with no obstructions and as it says here i have australian pricing here it's 139 dollars a month and you have to buy the hardware at 924 so if you're in the us that will be different different pricing uh, if in the europe that would be different pricing so that's the residential part of it that's the common one that's the one that most people have then there's a business version of this that's been launched and starlink for business is uh much more expensive like way more expensive it's, in australia it's 750 dollars a month compared to 139 and you have to buy the hardware for three thousand seven hundred and forty dollars i think in the us it's five hundred dollars a month us and two and a half thousand to buy the equipment <clears throat> so that's a lot more expensive what do you get for that you might ask well if you scroll down a bit here you can see that you get higher gain antenna uh you get additional throughput allocation which means that you are um you get priority for the bandwidth so these are designed for institutions, I would say, for, for a school, for example, uh, out in the middle of nowhere. It might be for a mining site, you know, things that are remote but require like a company size uh, connection. 
So uh, they're very expensive. They also have higher speed, lower latency. I mean, the, the latency, they can't really change that. The latency is what the latency is, I would have thought, because that's where the satellites are. But maybe they can do something. But yeah, they get you higher speeds, potentially. Um, and yeah, support. <clears throat> I think part of the, the sales pitch for this, particular for the business one, is that there is better support. Like you can call someone. Currently, you can't call anyone as Starlink. You have to send them a ticket, and then you may or may not get a, resp a response. There's an RV version, Starlink for RVs. This is a newer product. Which is quite cool. So it's meant to put on your well, RV or your mobile vehicle something, right? Now the idea is that you the idea is not that you use it while you're driving. The idea is that you drive to different cells, like we saw on the map before. So you can drive to different cells, and this will work in all cells, even if there's a wait list. However, you will get less speed in those uh, cells. So, but it should work everywhere, and. Uh, it's the same price for the hardware as the residential, but it costs more a month, $174 in Australia. And it's designed for people, obviously, that drive around. I have a, a friend that lives in a, in a van and he has six different internet connections, so this would be something for him, right? Be very good. And then as you see here, this is kind of cool. Pay as you go. You can actually pause it. So if you only use your RV or your camper or whatever, Six months a year, you don't have to pay for the other six months. So that's kind of neat, right? So you can pay it for a month at a time. Kind of cool. And then lastly, I think there's nothing else here. Easy setup. They always say easy setup. It is easy setup. Watch my other video. Link there if you want to see how easy it is to set up. And then there's the maritime version. And this is for, well, ships, eh? boats. And um, the idea here is that and you can use them at sea. Now, currently, if you look at the map here, check coverage you can click on the check coverage and it'll open up a pdf map here um, and you can see where the coverage is so it's just around the coasts here and the reason for that is that currently there's at the time of recording satellites are being put up that can connect to other satellites not just to the ground stations when those are everywhere they will be able to connect to each other and they won't even if there's not a ground station in sight which means that you can be in almost anywhere in the world on any ocean and you will be able to use starlink but they're not quite there yet so you can see it's around the coast here uh, in the us europe uh, australia south america that there is coverage yeah so those are the four different um oh yeah that's right spacex uses the starlink connection on their uh, ocean landing pads so yeah they're quite rugged they do work really well um at least that's what they say all right so i said i wanted to show you one of these really cool tools that i've found and it's uh it's this one it's starlink.sx now this is not affiliated with starlink it's made by a guy called mike puckle i think that's how you pronounce it um and it's a very cool tool i found it um oh over, over a year ago so this shows you currently how many satellites there are so there's 2208 uh, Starlink satellites at the time of recording of those 1827 are operational 381 on standby um, and it shows you where they all are you can see the grids here of where they are moving so they move in a pattern over the earth to cover all of it obviously and then there's some uh, uh, tools there on the right you can uh, so based on where you have set your home so you can you can mark where your address is which I've done you can see that Kernia has four satellites within reach and you can toggle these things on and off. So you can show lightning strikes. You put those on. Because um, that can have an effect, etc. You can see where the weather is. So you can show the weather. And that will come up uh, as clouds as well. Um, it's not showing any weather right now. Okay. Well, usually maybe I have to zoom in a bit. Um, but there's other tools here as well. And if you are a satellite nerd, this is very cool. <laughs> um, here we have the uh, orbital charts. We have... Um, H3 hexagonal grid setting. I don't know what most of these things are, to be honest. But I can see that in the six minutes I've had this page open, I've had outage of one second. Now, this is estimated, obviously, but it gives you a really good idea. Now, one of the really cool things is that you can see where your POP is. P-O-P, -P, point of presence. And they're the purple triangles you can see here. So in North America, there are a lot. There are a lot of pops. These are where you connect to the internet through. So it works with, the way it works with Starling is that um, my connection here, I have a satellite dish, and that 
shoots it up to a satellite the satellite finds a, finds a ground station so that's the orange dots on the map here and there's a lot of those and then the connection from the orange dot to the purple triangle is where the actual internet connection is so that's where the ping comes in so your, your point of presence is important because i have seen some videos uh, on youtube where people have been connected to the wrong pop like it's much further away from them than uh, another one which means that their latency is higher now in australia we only have one so if i just zoom in to on australia here we'll see here oh it's a bit there's a lot going on here so sometimes it's a little bit slow to react um there's a lot of moving things in javascript here um so you can see I live down here in Victoria, down the south. So there's the green. And you can see that's roughly what I can see uh, of the sky in terms of satellites. Because remember, it's up to four to 600 kilometers up. So it's not the horizon. It's um, where my, my dish can see. And <clears throat> you can see that there are a number of ground stations. And then the satellites are the ones, the, the dots, the green dots that are moving about. You can see them out here. They're everywhere. And they're the ones that I'm connecting to. And then you can see my pop is in Sydney. Uh, pop so that's the triangle that says two if you want to know what all these things mean click on the eye up here and that shows you all of the diff legend for all the different things that you might see on the map um, but this is very cool it gives you a great idea of how many satellites are up and how they're working and what's connecting to you where you are and how well um, you might be connected in, in your location so yeah go explore it if you want starlink.sx it's a very cool tool in summary, this is a short video, but I just wanted to make sure that people are aware that at the current status of recording, which is August 2022, there, is, there are a lot of limitations with Starlink, especially if you have a current fiber connection or a current land-based connection. It is highly likely that that is a better connection than Starlink, right? So Starlink is great. It's fantastic. I wouldn't have it any other way where I live, but if I could have a fiber connection, I would give it up any day no question like it's it's not that it, it doesn't compare that well the cool thing is that you can use it anywhere right you don't need to have a cable in the ground so make sure that you are aware of all of these things before you make a decision on starlink and i've had a lot of questions on these and if you have other questions do put them down in the comments i'm more than happy to try and answer anything i'm not an expert in satellite connections but i've been using it for a long time like five six years we're up to now uh, and almost a year on starlink so i have some experience with it but yeah starlink's great but it's not for everyone so yeah please um do subscribe to the channel if you enjoy this kind of content and let me know again uh if you have any questions put them in the comments and i'm more than happy to answer so until next time